Okay, great. Can everybody see that? Okay. Yeah, perfect. All right. So uh, thanks, Boinder, for the introduction. Um, as mentioned, my name's David Mansell, uh, and my sort of day job is working with the National Football Museum as a digital producer. Um, but I'll be joining Sporting Heritage today just to, to go through this webinar with you. So um, we had our introductions before, so we've got myself, uh, Boinder, and Kate as well. Um, if you have any questions, do feel free to send them to Kate and Boinder, and we'll, uh, we'll go through them at the end of the session. So in today's session, uh, we're basically going to break it up into six parts. Um, the session itself should last about an hour, um, and then we'll have a, a sort of generous amount of time for Q&As at the end. Um, if there aren't any questions, we do have some FAQs as well, so they may, you know, some stuff might come up there, but do feel free to send your questions on. Um, so to begin with, um, we're going to have a quick sort of introduction to video content. Um, and in that, we're going to be covering a few things like audience insights and the rationale about why you might produce video content. I know a few of the attendees are coming from a sort of heritage background and, you know, you do, you're doing kind of work with museums, galleries and all that sort of thing, and community groups. So I think if you're completely new to video content, some of this might be kind of useful if you're um, doing sort of advocacy in your own internal organization, you know, for a bit of time to do video content or a bit of resource. This is all stuff that might be sort of equip you, you know, to do that sort of thing. Um, the section after that will be, we'll be covering planning video projects. Um, so, you know, when, when you do these sorts of things, a, a question often comes up is sort of where do you start? You know, how long is a piece of string? You know, what should you do before you sort of even attempt anything like this? And, you know, we'll, we'll give you sort of a step-by-step -step guide to, to that sort of aspect of it. Um, on section number three, we're going to do a bit of jargon busting. So I'm going to go through some technical terms and keywords and all that sort of thing. And basically the whole idea of this is if you uh, sort of come out of this session wanting to do more video editing, um, you'll be equipped really to kind of do your own research, you'll know what things mean, and you'll be able to use this as a reference point and sort of build your skills and grow from there. And um, the sort of bulk of the session will be focusing on OpenShot. And the reason we've, we've chosen OpenShot is really it's a, it's a very good video editing program for people who are completely new to it. It's um, completely free. It's uh, quite fully featured, you know, in terms of being able to structure media, being able to add images, being able to add branding and all that sort of thing. So if you're doing sort of films on a low budget, um, you know, you, this, this is a good place to start really, as long as you're equipped to run it. Um, after that, we've got some next steps. And then like I said at the end, we've got a question and answer section. So, you know, feel free to send your questions throughout. Okay, great. So. On that introduction, if we just go through some sort of audience insights, um, obviously 2020 has been a bit of a funny year for, for all sorts of digital content, really. But sort of up until this point, the trend has really been, been on the up, you know, for user generated media. When I'm talking about this sort of thing, I'm, I'm primarily referring to sort of social media. So, you know, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, uh, TikTok, Instagram, all these sorts of platforms where, you know, a user can create account, an account and upload their own content to it, basically. Um, obviously, you know, if you're working within the community, you know, you, you probably are making use of these program uh, platforms, either in your marketing or, you know, you might be doing some on them yourself, you know, so um, it's kind of useful to sort of know, you know, have a broad understanding of this really, I think, before you, before you think of anything else really. So um, I've been having a look at some Ofcom reports. So uh, Ofcom, obviously the media watchdog, but the, you know, they also do a lot of the trend analysis and audience research and all that sort of thing. Um, so sort of in the crazy year of 2020, adults are spending sort of four hours a day online, sort of on average, and uh, one in three are watching sort of online video more than traditional TV. So, you know, terrestrial TV, so your BBCs, ITVs and all that sort of thing. And out of all those audience members, uh, two in five are actually starting to make video themselves. So, you know, we're, we're basically becoming a, a generation of content creators, I would think. And I think the idea of creating video and sharing video and telling stories is becoming more and more popular as time goes on in a, in a broad sense. From the same sort of report, um, I've, I've got this, uh, I pulled this sort of uh, graph out as well, uh, which contains, you know, quite, quite interesting data, I think. And I'm just going to go through a few bits and bobs. Mainly, this is a motivations graph. Um, so, you know, this is explaining why sort of, you know, these broad audience groups are, are doing video, essentially, you know, what they're hoping to gain from it. Uh, a lot of people want to share experiences with friends and family, and that goes for adults and children almost uh, equally there. Um, younger people, young, you know, children age 8 to 15, um, do a lot of video because they enjoy it and it's a hobby for them. 
And, you know, you might think of this as a sort of the YouTube generation, the TikTok generation, where sort of almost everybody with a smartphone is creating sort of some sort of content or engaging with it in some way. Um, the third one down uh, to be part of a community. Um, again, you know, as everybody's been isolated this year with the pandemic, I think a lot of people have turned to online content more and more, you know, just to just to do a lot of basic interaction, really. Um, you know, so online content's been helpful in that sort of sort of respect. I'm not going to go through absolutely everything. I mean, you can read this in your own time when we send the slides down, but one I'd like to draw your attention to is the um, sort of midway down about gaining followers and subscribers, and you'll see that that's sort of um, inversely skewed, you know, sort of towards children and young people. Um, you know, there's a, there's a re real sort of trend at the minute, I think, of online networking, you know, and using sort of video to build a profile for yourselves. You know, a lot of people want to start YouTube channels and, and do that sort of thing and use content in, in that way. So the data kind of reflects that sort of cultural trend at the moment. Um, just to sort of leave this section, uh, there was a headline from a Guardian article sort of on that note about young people. Um, online content is more and more, I think, becoming, it, it's been seen as a replacement for sort of traditional media outlets. So um, although a lot of young people have a lot of respect for the BBC and its services, I think the more likely to engage with, you know, YouTube and all that sort of thing, you know, first rather than say the iPlayer. So, you know, there's a real sort of shift in landscape towards sort of decentralized user-generated content over sort of bigger, bigger media, you know, uh, outputs, essentially. I'm not going to go too much in depth on the audience analytics and all that sort of thing, because it's not what this session's about. But I mean, it's useful to kind of have that, that knowledge, I think, you know, just as sort of in the back of your mind when you're thinking about how you're producing these contents and, you know, who you're doing it for. In terms of planning, the sort of key thing to remember when you're planning a piece of content is you are telling a story and you have a message you know, um, within that content, don't you? If you don't have a good message or a good story, there's, there's not really much point in doing video, is there? Now, the message can be something extremely simple. You know, you could be sharing, you know, if, you, if you're coming from a sporting heritage angle, you know, you could be sharing about your sporting experiences, you could be sharing your collection, um, you know, you could be sharing the same for other people as well. But it, the key thing to remember before you start any sort of video projects is what is your story, you know, what you're going for, what you're trying to tell, what you're trying to convey. I think if you're not sort of coming at this with any sort of, you know, marketing knowledge or anything like that, you know, you can break content down into three sort of key pillars, really. So we've got the story on the left, what's your story and who is it for? The destination in the middle, where's it going to go? So is it going to go on Facebook? Is it going to go on YouTube? Where will you share it? And how will you ensure that the story reaches those places? And sort of on that note as well, how will you make sure it's properly optimized? And we'll go into that in a little bit in more detail. And on the right, the format. So video is a powerful tool, but it is a tool, essentially, you know. Um, it's not that you're doing video. It's that you're telling a story in a particular way, if that makes sense. So how are you going to do this? Are you going to vlog? something are you going to uh, interview somebody are you going to do a how-to video etc so the format is really about what sort of genre a video can take and it's completely up to you really you know it's up to your creativity and how you think it's best to convey that story so on the topic of genre and um, just going to the national football museum a second and um, obviously where we've all been working from home and we've not been able to access the museum and people haven't been able to come to visit us we did a lot with our YouTube channel during this period, basically. Um, we uploaded a lot of video content to that and we tried a lot of new sort of things in that time period. Uh, we were able to do this because we had a lot of um, stock footage and, and things like that, you know, where we've met people previously. Uh, we've just come off the back of a major exhibition as well, Strip, How Football Got Shirty, which had a lot of sort of assets, you know, for that exhibition, which we'd all shot ourselves and, you know, it was all put, produced completely in-house. Um, but the sort of genres that we work with, uh, broadly speaking, we have interview content where we have, uh, you know, one or multiple uh, subjects um, shot with static shots and cutaways. So the, the example you can see there, that's an interview with somebody called uh, Chris Lockwood, who was a women's football player who played in the sort of um, post sort of 1971 post uh, FA ban era. And, you know, we were able to get her in and you know, share her story a couple of years ago. You know, we cut that into an interview, basically, uh, and that was a really sort of interesting way to share insights from that time period. 
Um, we've got features. Uh, so this is a video from our strip exhibition. This was about um, a club called 1874 Northwich, who uh, sort of made sort of international news with their sort of away kit, which was designed by an illustrator called Phil Galloway. Uh, and we visited Northwich in 2019 and basically uh, shot footage of their match um, where they played in this kit. Um, we, we shot some interviews with a few people from the club and the designer, and we were able to pull all this together into sort of like a three minute documentary, really. Um, the other sort of content we've been experimenting a lot with this year is list videos. Um, so if you go onto YouTube, you know, if you're, especially if you've got kids or anything like that, or you're a younger person, um, you know, you see a lot of top 10 videos, don't you? Um, we kind of did our own sort of take on that called First Eleven. And the concept of First Eleven is every sort of episode of it starts with a, with a concept. So, you know, you might have something like the FA Cup and we pick 11 objects that sort of relate to that concept from our collection. And we were able to produce First Eleven entirely with images. So we didn't film anything for it. We just had high quality photographs, which we'd done sort of as part of our digitization projects. Um, and we sort of brought that to life, you know, with animations and CGI and all that sort of thing. And um, the last sort of genre on there is how-to videos. Uh, and we mainly did this for our family audiences. If you follow us on Facebook and Twitter, you might have seen, you know, some of, some of this sort of stuff. Uh, you know, how to, how to make a, you know, a, a football trophy out of a water bottle, how to make a table, football table, et cetera. Just little videos shot on a mobile phone, um, you know, with minimal editing, basically. Um, and the idea is, you know, somebody learns a new skill from these, essentially. So hopefully you can, you can kind of see what I'm talking about with all these sort of things. Each video starts with a strong concept. So is it, you know, is it interviewing a former player? Is it about a, a football club? You know, is it a, is it a list video? Uh, is it a how-to video, et cetera? And then from there, you know, we build the final products essentially. So when we talk about optimizing content for social media, there's a couple of things to kind of bear in mind really. Um, the first one really is knowing your length limits. And by that, I mean, sort of a double whammy really, you know, it, it's knowing how long a video you can actually post on these platforms. So for instance, if you're posting something on Twitter, it can only be um, 140 seconds long. Um, and the other sort of length limit we talk about is kind of how long an audience member will actually engage with that video before moving on to something else. So the idea with that is, you know, um, because there's a lot of content out there at the moment, you know, when somebody's scrolling through Twitter or Facebook or whatever, you really need to be sort of eye-catching sort of within the first sort of 20 seconds, really. You know, some say 30 seconds, but it's good to do it within the first sort of 20 seconds and sort of get get the main message of your video across in that time, you know, before somebody moves on and then you're more likely to retain viewers basically so you know if you're sort of doing a piece to camera it's really good to have your sort of main message out there within the first sort of 20 seconds you know um sort of an extension for that it's good to it's good to think of this like your hook basically what's going to hook your viewers in what's going to keep them watching what you know what you're trying to tell people with this piece of content um, another thing that's often sort of overlooked with web video is um, there's a quite surprising statistic, which I don't think a lot of people are aware of, but when people are watching videos, say on Facebook and Twitter and all that sort of thing, um, a lot of the time it's actually without sound, you know, they're not listening to it in headphones or playing it on speakers or whatever. So the way a lot of people get around this is actually by burning in subtitles or using transcripts. So on Facebook, for instance, you know, you've got like an option where you can enable subtitles, uh, so as well as being great for accessibility reasons, it's also good, you know, to kind of retain your audience and get them interested in your video, you know, to, to, to include those where possible. Um, some video editing applications have the option to kind of write your own subtitles, you know, as you're as you editing your video. And where others don't, you can use like a free sort of online, uh, like .srt. The, a lot of the time the file extension is .srt, subtitle rip. Um, so, you know, have a look online and see, see, you know, what you can use otherwise. Uh, what else have we got? So another thing about audience members is increasingly, as we're living in this digital world, we're also living in a mobile first world, really. You know, a lot of the time people are watching stuff on the mobile phones, aren't they? And mobile phones look like this and not like this, don't they? So when you're thinking about shooting your videos, you know, think about somebody holding it on a mobile phone, if you're shooting something in a square format, which I'll go into in a second, it's automatically going to look bigger on a mobile phone than, you know, like a traditional uh, piece of media, you know, a, a traditional rectangular piece of media. 
Um, so you can use your aspect ratio and your resolution settings to kind of make the most of that. Um, but also, um, you know, with that, bear in mind where it's going. So, you know, is it going on Twitter? Is it going on YouTube? Is it going on TikTok? Because all these different uh, platforms have different considerations, which I'll go through in a second. So just moving before we go on to the OpenShot case study, um, we'll have a look at some keywords, some technical terms and some jargon. So the whole idea of doing this is, you know, if you come out of this session and you're wanting to research more video editors and you want to give it a go and you want to learn the terminology, this is a really good place to start with that basically. So I start with NLE, so that's a non-linear editor. So a non-linear, so in, in video editing, if we're talking about non-linear video editing, that essentially means that you can take a piece of media and edit it in any order. So it's not like traditional sort of film editing, you know, where you've got like pieces of film and you need to cut them in specific orders, you know, with, with this sort of editing, you know, you can do it in any order and you can, it's a non-destructive process essentially. Um, as we're talking about OpenShot, the specific thing I'm going to call it here is the OpenShot profile, but this is just essentially the project settings. And, you know, so this is a basic sort of information you've got, um, you know, for your video projects, you know, your resolution and your frame rate, which I'll go on to in a second. Um, when we're talking about video resolution, you know, you might be familiar with this if you've ever bought a TV or a camera in recent years, you know, you're talking about HD video, 4K, Ultra HD, et cetera. Basically, to, to understand this, all of it is, is, you know, essentially the amount of pixels in a frame. Um, so if you're thinking about HD video, um, there's 1,920 pixels across uh, by 1,080 pixels um, above, essentially, up. Uh, so, you know, this is just a way of measuring the total pixel count in a video. Um, and, you know, you can see that kind of increases the more sort of high definition you go. The main advantage of having more pixels in the video image is it just means you can retain more detail. So if, if anybody's ever seen 4K compared to standard HD, you'll, you'll know what I'm talking about. You know, 4K, you know, looks more detailed, it looks shinier, et cetera. And of course, we're going on to 8K soon as well. So that means everybody will have to rebuy the television sets at some point soon. We won't need to get 8K television sets, but that's, a, that's for another, another matter. Um, aspect ratio. So aspect ratio and video resolution aren't the same thing. Uh, so this is, it's just why it's important, I think, to kind of get a, get a handle on this, you know, before you progress. Aspect ratio is basically just the relationships between the, the height and the width of the video frame. So a common sort of aspect ratio you see on televisions nowadays and monitors is there 16 by nine. So all that means is if you imagine the bottom is 16 units across, then the, uh, the sort of height will be nine units up, if that makes sense. So a common sort of um, aspect ratio online on social media is one by one. So that's a square basically. And within that aspect ratio, you know, you can have different resolutions, you know, so you can have HD 16 by nine, or you can have, um, you know, standard definition, uh, so that's 16 by nine, if that makes sense. I'll show you some comparisons as well, so you'll know what I'm talking about in a second. I've got some diagrams. Um, pixel ratio, so as well as the aspect ratio of the whole frame, um, pixel ratio relates to the actual shape of the individual pixels themselves. And it's quite an advanced thing, really, this. If you're just starting out on video editing, you won't probably come across this unless you're converting things, you know, from um, sort of old films and old TV programs and all that sort of thing. But if you're just shooting for web video, the most sort of common pixel ratio is one by one. And a lot of website players can correct for this anyway, you know, most of the time. So it's not something you, you, you need to worry too much about, really. Um, however, something you do need to worry about is the frame rate. So um, as we all know, a video is basically just a series of pictures played back really fast. And, you know, your eyes can't kind of perceive the difference, can they, at, you know, sort of higher frame rates. So um, the sort of standard sort of frame rate you might see on TV is sort of around like 30 frames per second. And then like in films, you know, it's about 25. So if, you, if you're used to watching TV and films, you'll kind of know what this looks like, you know, instinctively. And um, basically, all you need to know with this is the higher a frame rate is, um, the smoother the video is going to look. You know, if the eye can't really perceive the difference between the frames, you know, when you, when you look at it, it just looks like a continuous image, essentially. Um, if you're shooting on smartphones and things like that, most will be set to sort of like 30 frames or 25 frames per second by default. And a lot of websites will be able to play these back, no problem at all. So just bear that in mind, um, because obviously, you know, when you start a new project, some video editors, it'll, it'll ask you all this sort of thing, and, you know, you'll just have to check that it's all correct and ready for what you want. 
Uh, and the last thing just to just to bear in mind on our jargon is uh, video encoding um, and that's basically just a process of compressing a video file so um, essentially when you make a video it's like having a big pot and you're throwing all your ingredients into it aren't you you know all your, all your delicious sound and images and video and all that sort of thing so a video encoding profile is just what the software does to kind of um, cook all that together if that makes sense and ensures that it can be played back on a website so again, when you're exporting videos and your video editors, you might get asked a question of what sort of encoding you want to use. If you're using, uh, if you're producing videos mainly for the web, um, the one you want to stick to is H.264. Okay, so talking about resolutions, and then we'll go on to aspect ratio in a second. Um, this is an approximation of how sort of different resolutions are sized, you know, in terms of the actual pixels in a video. So. If we think of standard definition, uh, which is, you know, uh, sort of like, you know, the resolution of old TVs compared to high definition uh, or 720p, we can see that there's much more pixels in a high definition image compared to a standard definition one. And the same for a full HD one. Again, so if you've got a modern TV, this is sort of what you'll be watching your content in most of the time. Uh, quad HD, which is 4K, if you've got a bit more of a fancy TV, you know, I think, to be honest, I think a lot of TVs are sold as um, 4K TVs nowadays, anyway, you know, above a sort of certain size. And, uh, you know, this is the same for mobile phones, you know, some of you might have 4K phones or HD phones otherwise. So basically, this is a sort of, sort of you know, real estate you're working with, you know, in terms of pixels and, and all that sort of thing in videos. Um, again, with aspect ratios, um, on the left, you know, we've got 16 by 9 aspect ratio. So that's what I was talking about before. This is kind of like rectangular video. And, and you'll notice it looks like a modern TV or it looks like a modern monitor. And if you're on a site like YouTube or Facebook or Twitter, uh, you'll see a lot of content, you know, that's, that's sort of shot in this resolution. Um, moving on to the right in the center, alternatively, if you're a fan of Instagram and TikTok, um, they use a special aspect ratio, nine by 16, uh, which is basically a 16 by nine aspect ratio, but flipped, um, because it's like we were saying before, if you think of a mobile phone, a mobile phone looks like this, doesn't it? Not like this. So Instagram is basically optimized um, for that sort of thing. And so, you know, so is TikTok as well. On the right, we've got our square video as well. Um, and you know, you have the option on Facebook and Twitter to post in this format. And basically the, the whole sort of uh, idea of that is just making it look a bit bigger on people's timelines. So it's more eye catching basically, you know, this is all little tricks that people use, you know, to make people engage with the content essentially. And um, the only thing to bear in mind with these sorts of things as you can probably imagine is if you're, if you're filming like this on a mobile phone, for instance, you know, you're filming in a 16 by nine aspect ratio you've got more kind of real estate sort of outside the center to work with in the frame, haven't you? You know, so you could put somebody off to the side, you know, if you're shooting interviews and all that sort of thing, or, you know, you can have things going on in the side of a frame. Whereas if you compare that to um, the Instagram one or the uh, optimized Facebook and Twitter one, you've basically got less room in the frame to work with. And this is really kind of noticeable if you watch like a traditional film, you know, that's been sort of clipped down um, and, you know, it's been posted on Facebook or whatever. Sometimes there's things missing in frame, you know, people talking to nothing and all that sort of thing. So the main thing to bear in mind is if you're going down this route, you know, you've got to just be very careful of how you frame things and how you shoot videos to ensure that it's actually going to show up in the, in the final products, you know, and work correctly. I think if you're a complete beginner, I'd start by using 16 by nine aspect ratios and, and kind of just getting used to how things are framed uh, in that, you know, it gives you a bit more sort of room to work with and then you can move on to the other stuff if you if you fancy that as well okay so with those sort of bits of housekeeping out of the way we're just going to go on to the open shot case study and this is this is quite detailed i know people are saying before you know that they've uh, downloaded open shot and they've had a go and they weren't really sure of how to use it so hopefully it will be a really good sort of introduction to, to kind of how that editor works uh, like i said as well you know if you are going on to use other editors um open shot is a it's, it's kind of like a good watermark, I think, because it has a lot of sort of features um, that other editors have as well, you know. So if you really, if you, if you get used to using OpenShot, you could go and see use something like iMovie or Adobe Premiere or something like that and think, oh yeah, that, that's very similar to how we do it in OpenShot. And, you know, these sort of concepts are very similar as well. So that's kind of like why we're going to go in detail into OpenShot. Again, if you've never made a video before, you might be thinking, where do I start, you know? Do I just open my camera? Do I do, do I do this, that, and the other? And 
you know, same with editing as well. Um, what's the first step with that? Um, I've put together a bit of a project workflow here. And, and, you know, when you go through the PowerPoint again, you'll be able to have a look at this yourself. Um, so in terms of using OpenShot, um, this is basically, this is basically the, the steps you'll have to take to do that. So on setting up, um, you've got options basically to set your projects up, set that aspect ratio, set your resolutions, etc. From there, you can import your media. From there, you can structure your edit. So basically the best thing to do with video editing is get all your um, footage and images and everything like that in the order you want it to be on your timeline. You know, So if you're going to be cutting away from things, if you're going to be showing different things, do all that first before you do anything else, because from there you can start to go into it and fine tune it. You know, you can add effects, uh, you can add your music, you can add your branding, you can make your cuts, etc. And from there, you'll be able to export the video. And um, again, just a little bit on time management. So um, like I mentioned before, where do I, where do I start with this sort of thing? Um, I've kind of broken this down into a ratio, which, you know, it's, it's kind of a good thing to, to use perhaps if you're not very experienced. So of all video projects, I'd say the most important part of it is planning it. So this goes for shooting, it goes for editing it, et cetera. You know, plan out what you're gonna be saying, plan out what messages you want to deliver and plan out kind of the final products where it's gonna be going as well. Get all this in your mind before you even hit record on your camera. After you've done all that, it's very easy, I think, to, to go into the shooting and say, right, I need this shot, I need to record this bit, I need to, take images of this sort of thing and you can gather all that in that step when you come to editing it then you should have a really kind of clear structure in your head or written down of whatever works for you and you'll be able to do that much quicker then as a result of that after that you know it's useful I think if you're doing this from an organizational point of view to spend a bit of time on the marketing aspects of it as well you know thinking about is it complete is it properly optimized for Facebook is it properly optimized for Twitter etc if I post it on these platforms, is it going to reach the sort of desired audience? So you can adjust this, you know, as much as you need. This is, but this is how I like to, you know, plan my content. Basically, this is how I like to manage my time when I'm doing video projects. Okay, so going on to just before we look at the open shot video editor, another sort of useful thing uh, to kind of keep in mind with it all is keeping your media organized in a good way, essentially. And you know, this kind of comes into your planning, comes into your time management sort of thing. I've got two examples on the screen there of uh, how you might organize media for a video project. Uh, one is better than the other. I can probably let you guess which one, which one I think is the best way of doing it. Um, but you know, if you label things, you have things in folders, if you structure things correctly, it really makes it much, much easier to kind of produce a finished product. Okay, great. So let's have a look at OpenShot in depth now. So the things we're going to be covering now in the workspace section, we're going to be having a look at the different panels, we're going to be having a look at the different tools, and we're going to be having a look at the different menus. So this should be quite detailed and quite technical, but again, if you do have any questions, please feel free to uh, note them down and, and we'll have a look at them in the end in detail. So when you first open OpenShot, you might have something like this, essentially. Um, it'll be broken down into different windows, and I'm going to go for each window, essentially, what, what they all do in depth. So to start with, we've got the project files window here. So when you import media into OpenShot, um, it should show up in these little folders here. So we have video, we have audio, we have images, and we have, you know, like a show all section here. This kind of helps you to keep it all organized, essentially, you know. So if you're going back to your planning stage and you say, I need to shoot, you know, three bits of video, you know, for this project, you should be able to find them all in the video tab. If you say, I've got three images to show, they should be there in your images and, you know, any kind of music and voiceovers and all that sort of thing should show up in your audio, audio tab as well. Next to that, we've got a video preview window uh, and that's basically showing you the media that you've got on your timeline right now. So if you see just in this sort of grayed out area at the bottom of the, um, bottom of the editor, so, you know, you've got your timeline panel there and you've got like a little playhead and you'll be able to kind of left click on that and, you know, drag that through the media and that'll show you, you know, a particular bit of media at any second, essentially. Uh, on here, I've got some lovely sort of holiday snaps I took. Um, so we've got San Francisco in the background there. Um, and that's just from the playhead basically being at the very start of the video. So if I was to move that playhead, you'd be able to see different parts of it. Underneath it, the window, you've got some uh, controls. So you've got a play button, you've got a fast forward button, and you've got a skip to the end as well, and, and ditto, you know, for the reverse. 
So that allows you to kind of preview what you're working on in real time, basically. If you press play, it'd go from the start of the media there and go all the way through in this example. We've got our timeline panel at the bottom and that's broken up into tracks. So basically a track in a video editing program is just a, it's an empty space for you to put media, to put information, data, et cetera. So on my um, profile here, I've got a track called video audio. I've got a track four and I've got track five and I'll just go through these very quickly. So um, it's a customizable workspace. You've got some buttons above, you know, to take things away, to add things and all that sort of thing. Um, Basically, what you've got to bear in mind is a track can only contain one piece of media at any given moment. So if you see on track five here, I've got this image, yeah? I couldn't then add another image or another piece of video on top of that. I'd have to put it next to it or before it, okay? So that track is only going to show that image at that given moment. Underneath that on track four, I've got a video clip, which will just kind of play all the way through to its duration, essentially. And, and the track will allow me to to cut that by dragging it or using the razor tool, which I'll talk more about in a second. On the audio, I've got the um, video audio separated. And the whole idea of that is basically that I'll, uh, I'll narrate over it, for instance, or I might take bits of it away, but you know, we'll have a look at that more in a second. So just before we go any further, I'll just have a look at these timeline tools in detail. On the left-hand side, we've got an add track button that allows you to insert more tracks. And, and you know, you know what video editors, um, you know, you've got the option to add as many tracks as you need sometimes. Uh, in others, you, you might not have, but you know, in OpenShot, you can add a lot of tracks to it. You've got a snapping tool, which is basically looks like a magnet, and that toggles, toggles their timeline snapping. So the whole idea with that is if you dragged a piece of media onto the timeline, if you have that snapping tool enabled, that means that the media will sort of fall into place a lot easier. You know, you're not going to put it over another piece of media. It'll automatically kind of go to the uh, to the next piece of media along, you know, you, there's no sort of day, danger of overwriting your data there. And um, the next one along is the razor tool that looks like a pair of scissors and that allows you just to make cuts in the media. So let's say for instance, you were shooting a piece to camera where you were presenting something and you needed a second, you know, to look at your script or, you know, you, you did a false start, you hesitated. The razor tool allows you to kind of go into the media and cut those bits out. You know, you can you can kind of you can use a razor tool to cut the piece of media and then you can select it and get rid of it. So that allows you to kind of tidy your edit up. The other bits um, are kind of useful if you're using OpenShot to work with other people. So you've got um, tools for adding markers um, and moving around the project based on those markers. So um, this really kind of comes into it if you're doing a, a sort of bigger edit and you need to make, kind of make notes of things, you know, you've got the option to add sort of metadata there and, you know, um, sort of break the edit down into separate bits. So I won't dwell on those too much, really. So as I mentioned before, it, as you're structuring uh, an edit, you basically be dragging stuff from the project panel down onto your timeline. So on this example, I've dragged this movie file onto track five. And that's sort of shown up for the full duration of that. Now, say I only wanted up to about 40 seconds of that, what I could do is I could grab it from the end on the right-hand side and I could drag it down to 40 seconds and that'll edit out everything else, you know, sort of past that point. Or I could use a razor tool and cut bits of it out individually, if that makes sense. If we're using images, it's slightly different because an image doesn't have a sort of length, does it necessarily? You know, an image um, in OpenShot, it will appear for a default duration of about 10 seconds. Uh, you can change that in the file, in the preferences tab. So if you go file preferences and image length, you can set that to something shorter if you want, so five seconds. If we're thinking about sort of using this in, a, in context, um, it's good to be able to work with images if you've got sort of photographs of things or scans of things, you know, scans of documents or photographs of objects or that sort of thing. Um, you can add those in without even necessarily needing to film them. So it also means if you're coming at this from an organization, organizational point of view, you know, you can um, produce media sort of on a lower budget there. You know, you don't necessarily need to get a camera out to film something or have somebody presenting some video, something like that. You know, you can make it kind of like an image an image video uh, where most of the video's images and you know you might record a voiceover and put that in and you know structure the video that way and um, i'm just going to show you kind of like a diagram now basically of how how you might sort of produce a video so how it's broken down into into different parts so 
if you're producing, say, a piece to camera where you're presenting something, you might start out with some main footage. You know, you might shoot something on your phone. You might shoot yourself uh, presenting something, and that'll be your A-roll. From there, you might want to add cutaways. So on this example, I've got a, a cutaway of a website, and I've got a cutaway of um, a, a different camera angle where I'm showing something off. And, you know, you can add your audio as well. And basically, the way you do this is stacking things on the tracks, if that makes sense. So you would... Um, play something on a video track so if we just go back a second so you see here on track five if I wanted to place um that video over something I could place something underneath it on track four and the top video will display over it if that makes sense so I can show you this in diagram form actually so let's say we've got our main footage on track one if we wanted to cut away from that main footage, all we'd need to do is take another piece of video or an image or something like that and put it on track two, just like that. We have our audio as well. So basically what that means is we can play our audio whilst keeping the sort of um, cutaways intact, if that makes sense. We don't have to go away from our audio on our main sort of feature. You know, we can, we can use our, uh, our cutaways to do that. So talking about audio, um, a lot of the time, if you're thinking about um, using voiceovers and using cutaways and all that sort of thing, OpenShot has a great feature where you can actually separate the audio of the video track. So if we start the top image, that's what it looks like when we drag a video um, onto a timeline. Um, so the audio file will sort of be embedded in that. If we right click on that video and click separate audio, the audio then goes onto its own track and we can start cutting that top video up into different pieces. So if you see on the third one, what I've actually done is I've cut the video at the um, six second mark and I've inserted some other footage in, you know, I've just got rid of bits I don't need. And um, that means we can keep the edit varied, but we can also keep the audio from that first track. So in terms of structuring advice, um, I'm just gonna say, there's a few things to keep in mind basically. So, you know, the first one is keep your mind on your message. So, you know, get rid of stuff that doesn't, doesn't, you know, doesn't keep your message. You know, if you've got, if you're playing video back and you find it's not flowing very well, you know, you can just get rid of bits like that. You know, you can cut them out. It makes more sense to do it that way. Use your B-roll to keep it interesting. You know, sometimes I think if you're just looking at a bit, picture of somebody presenting something, just presenting something without anything else in the frame, I think it can be quite boring for a lot of viewers, uh, especially on social media where there's a lot of other stuff to watch. So make sure you're using your B-roll, you know, to keep your edit varied. And another final thing you can do is get a second opinion as well. So, you know, if you're working in an organization, it's always useful, I think, to show these things to people and say, you know, what are you getting from this, from, from this video? You know, what are the messages? Do you think it's, do you think it's um, conveying what we need it to, et cetera? You know, get a second opinion on stuff. Show it to a critical friend, essentially. Okay, great. So moving on, we've got the uh, properties panel on the left uh, and the properties panels, it's quite a good tool, I think, in OpenShot to be able to kind of uh, give you a lot of control over the content you're producing. So if you have a look on there, it's got various options, you know, a few pieces of media, you know, you've got stuff like um, cropping, you know, you've got stuff like scaling, um, you've got stuff like shearing, which is basically like applying a 3D effect to it. Uh, and you've got stuff like, you know, volume controls as well for audio down there. So let's see, we'll see some of that in a second. Um, but before we move on, I know a couple of people are asking questions before the session about applying effects and animations and all that sort of thing. In OpenShot, there is a dedicated effects panel. If you can just see it on that previous image, it's just above the uh, timeline. There's an effects button. You can click that and that brings a window up just like this. So we've got stuff for like adding brightness adjustments. We've got stuff for adding blurring. Uh, we've got stuff for adding saturation adjustments and we've got other crazy things as well. Um, some of these I'd say right now are more useful than others, if that makes sense. So stuff like your brightness might be useful. If you shoot a shot that's underexposed, you can adjust that using the effects panel there. Talking about the crazy ones, uh, this is a color shift one. Uh, so if we applied that to a piece of footage, you know, you get something like this. Basically the way these effects work is you start by using a piece of footage on the timeline, uh, drag your effects onto it, and then you'll see it sort of applied in a video preview window. You'll see the output of it here. So here's an example of the color shift used on a piece of footage. It ends up looking very psychedelic. 
I think what I'll do after I come out of this um, profile is I'll show you these things sort of live as well, actually in open shot, it might be more useful to kind of see them happening live. In the properties panel, we've also got the option of transforming images uh, according to X and Y values. And again, if you are working with images, this is a kind of useful skill to kind of have in mind. So basically, if you're clicking on an image and it brings up its properties panel, sometimes when you look at the image in the video preview window, you might see that it might be a bit small. So you'll need to apply a scaling value to do it. And the way this works is it works on a, on a Y axis and an X axis. So I've got like a diagram of it there, you see. So basically you've got your x-axis on the bottom and the y-axis on the top. And that's just how OpenShot kind of calculates it essentially. And it's the same for a lot of other video editors as well. So if we were to apply a scaling effect to the x and y value, if we wanted to make this image bigger, where we've got 0.5 on the scale x and y, we might type in something like 1.5, you know, and that'll make it much bigger than what we're seeing there. However, we need to make sure that we're doing what we do to one, we do to the other, unless you want something like this really wide bird here, you see, um, that's an inappropriately scaled image. You know, we've only scaled one value there. So if we scale both proportionately, we can see that the image goes bigger. And this works as well for shrinking things as well, basically. You know, if you've got something that's too big and you want to get it more in frame, you can use it this way. Um, a quick note to do when, you, when, you, when you're when you working with images as well, be aware that you can only kind of scale things up to a certain amount before you start seeing pixels. So if you see on the left, if you imagine that that image has been scaled, say, 10 times its original value, all you'll see is a pixelated mess on the left, uh, whereas on the right, you know, um, that's what you're kind of missing out on. So make sure you're not scaling things too much. Within this value, we can actually also animate the scaling as well. Uh, and that's very easy to do. That's using something called keyframes, which I'll show you in a second. So here we can see that the image scales up and then it scales back down. And that's just a very simple animation. You can add hints of things using OpenShot. So basically with keyframes, you've got um, the option to insert a keyframe when you've got something on the timeline. So you do this um, by right clicking this sort of desired property you want to animate and you'll see that it turns green there. When you move your playhead to the end of the image or another part in the image or the video, if you right click again and insert another keyframe, you've basically got a range where you can tell OpenShot, I want to scale this say three times by the end of it. So, you know, that's how you produce effects like this essentially. And I'll, I'll probably show you that in the editor as well because it'll make more sense to, to see that in action. Um, if you don't want to use keyframes, if you don't want to do it manually, there's also animation presets there as well. Um, one of the things you might be wondering about is how I add captions to things. How do I have branding? How do I add titles? Um, and there is a dedicated title button in OpenShot. Uh, you get some interesting effects uh, like that hot rod flame at the bottom, which you might want to stick away from. Um, but, you know, there's also basic titles there. We've got the option of changing fonts, changing text colors, backgrounds, etc. Um, the only thing I think to bear in mind with titles when you're using them sort of over video footage is how kind of visible they are. So it's useful, I think, to pick a high contrast uh, background and uh, font color, you know, for that sort of thing. So, uh, for instance, what you might want to do is put a black background over something and then make the text white. And then that ensures that people can read it very easily. Or, you know, you can experiment with that as well, you know, with contrasting colors. Um, if you're using titles on the timeline, they basically work exactly like images. So, you know, you drag those on and they behave like an image does essentially. So uh, you'll be able to drag those out. You'll be able to resize them just as you want to. And, you know, and you can cut them as well, you know, if you want to um, say so make them appear for one frame and then disappear for another frame, you know, if you wanted to do that. Uh, another sort of tool within OpenShot is transitions. So if you basically, when you, um, if you were sort of, if you have two pieces of media next to each other on the timeline, the video editing program will automatically cut between both of those. You know, you'll just see one shot disappear and then one appear in an instant, you know, and that's actually that's used all, you know, in all sorts of stuff, isn't it? You know, you see that on TV all the time, you see it in all sorts of pieces of media, you know, a lot of the time when people think of transitions, you know, they might be thinking of their kind of really fancy flashy stuff. And I think a lot of the time it's probably not really needed to be honest beyond sort of things maybe fading away now and again you've got the option there so add a fade to the end of the image if you want to or the end of the video um but you know all the other sort of really flashy really psychedelic trans transitions what you've got to bear in mind is I think a lot of the times these things are distracting for the audience 
So it's probably you know useful to stay away from those unless it kind of really adds something to your video file. Okay, great. So with that sort of all out of the way, um, the final thing you want to do before you before you sort of you know send your video projects off is export it. Uh, and you do that just by clicking the red button or there's a file export option there. So if you're thinking back to our sort of keywords before, you can see there, you know, you've got options to change your resolution, change your frame rate, etc. Uh, so, you know, make sure that's kind of correct for what you want it to be going for. So with this one, you know, it's going to YouTube, it's in HD, 1920 by 1080, 25 frames per second. So that should look pretty good on, on the website, basically. Okay, before we move on, I am just going to show you a couple of things. I'll, I'm just going to stop sharing my screen on uh, the PowerPoint. I'm just going to pop open shot on. Open shot on. Uh, if you just bear with me one second. So can you guys all see that here? So rather than just showing you images, essentially, I'm just going to show you these sorts of things live. So when I was talking about sort of dragging things into the timeline, if you see, it's just as simple as this. So I'm left clicking here, drag on there. And these are image files. So essentially, all I can do with these is I can set the length of these just by dragging, just like this. So if we want to include photographs or images, it's as simple as doing it this way. You'll notice, basically, when I left click on the left-hand side, here's the properties panel here. So this is what I was talking about before in terms of scale and things. So we have our scale X value here. Uh, we can just double-click this, and we can type in a value that we might want. Let's go for free. And we can see immediately that that makes the image too wide. Um, however, if we go to the scale Y value and replicate what we just did there, we can see that that works proportionally much better, although we can't see too much of the image. So, you know, just be careful with that. Let's, you know, maybe scale it to 0.75 on both. You can see that looks much better there, doesn't it? Doing it that way. Um, what else have we got? So. Uh, if I just show you these transitions as well, so here's our transitions and the way you make these work is you can drag these on the timeline between two clips basically. So if we want to drag these two images on, we can apply the transition between them just like this and scale it very, very simply. So, you know, it's not massively very difficult to use really, you know, it's just a case of getting used to the layout. Uh, in terms of the multiple tracks, if you see here, I'll just show you that very quickly. We can drag things on there. And you can see that in this case, if we have something underneath the image, it'll kind of show up behind it. So what you might want to do there is just move it just over there. So this would be really useful, for instance, if you wanted this video to play, this image to play over a piece of video, you know, you could kind of, you know, talk about that, uh, cut away to it, essentially. Uh, if we have a look at our effects here, this is just as simple as dragging them onto our desired uh, thing. So we can drag this blur value onto here. And we can control that just by clicking the little icon that appears. So if I just zoom in there for you one second, we can see that there's a little icon. If we click that, that allows us to set our blur value. We can control it with this little radius tool by clicking inputting a value into it and we can make the image more or less blurry. If we put it to zero, for instance, we should see it very clearly. I think it's taken a second, so I've got load up there. Uh, let's just try another effect on there. Just remove that. Let's try the uh, shift, color shift, sorry. There we go. So, you know, we've got different properties here to animate. We can just input numbers into these and uh, experiment with them and see what they do. Uh, let's try a blue shift on that one. There we go. We can see that the effect's starting to take place there. If I just show you the keyframes very quickly, just before I move back to the presentation, just how simple it is to add keyframes to things. So if we want to add a keyframe to this value here, all we need to do is go right to the start, click insert keyframe. Let's put a value in there. Let's put 0.5. And then we just need to scroll at some point to add another keyframe there. Well, that's a free, and we can see we've got an animation there going ahead very simply. So again, other video editors are the similar sort of feature sets to this, really. Um, 
I'm going to show you the presets as well quickly. We can right click on these and we've got options to sort of fade these in. So at the start of a clip, we can fade this image in slowly and we'll see that the image fades in. Cool. So we'll just quickly go back onto the presentation. Uh, share screen. I'll just start through some next steps very quickly. So, I mean, obviously that was a very, very basic introduction to, to video editing there. Um, and I think really in terms of being able to develop your skills now, I think the best way to do it is just to have a quick go of it. You can see that you can do it with the Im images. Uh, you don't even need to go out and shoot anything, you know, to actually be able to work with the, the workspace. Um, if you do kind of get more and more into it, you'll see that there's kind of a lot of skills, you know, that you can develop as a result of video editing, you know, so, you know, there's... Um, so obviously, aside from the filming side of it, you know, you've got the audio side, the graphic design side, uh, the animation side, you know, you can make these things very, very complicated if you want to. Um, but, you know, as well, um, these things like writing and project management to, you know, to bear in mind. Let's have a look at some alternative NLEs and if you don't want to use OpenShot. So if you're on a, a Mac, you know, you could go for iMovie, which is very, very similar. Um, or if you want to pay a bit of money, you can get a program called Premiere Elements, which is by Adobe. Uh, and Adobe are kind of like the industry leaders, really, for creative software. You know, we've got uh, solutions, you know, that scale all the way down from professional use all the way to kind of like enthusiast and consumer use. Uh, Premiere Elements is their sort of basic video editing platform. And it's very, very similar to OpenShot, really. Um, you know, I, I think it's probably best starting off on OpenShot and then you'd be fine, but you want to do specific things with video editing, you can move on to something like Premiere Elements. If you're on a mobile phone, there's an app called KineMaster, which is very good. Um, it's very similar to OpenShot, but it doesn't have the multiple sort of track feature that you see in OpenShot. And it's also got like a paid and a, and a free version. So I think on the free version, you know, when you export a video, it'll have like a watermark on it, which might not be massively suitable for your purposes, depending on what you're doing. Uh, you've also got Power Director, which again is, has free and paid options. And you've got Premiere Rush, which is Adobe's sort of offering of their mobile um, editing solutions. Uh, with the Premiere Rush, you have to buy a subscription to Adobe though, so it does cost a little bit of money. You know, if you've got some budget to work with though, it might be possibly a good thing to look into, I think. Um, as well as this is some of the resources that we can have a look at. So um, if you've been following Sporting Heritage's work, we've actually got some great resources on their website, uh, which are very useful from sort of all aspects of video production. Uh, so from the filming side, if you're coming at this wanting to know more about filming things, you know, putting yourself in front of the camera and all that sort of thing, um, have a look at their guides that you've got available on there. We've also got some past webinars. Um, there's a guy, there's a, one with a filmmaker called Cy Gamble who does a lot on um, the sort of practicalities of actually shooting yourself and shooting subjects. Uh, have a look at that one. That's available on YouTube. Um, and there's also another great sort of uh, tutorial video on sort of sharing your collection with film content. And again, if you've not downloaded OpenShot yet, there's a link there to download OpenShot and have a go with it too. I think that's probably just about the end of the presentation now then. Um, so I think we were gonna go on to questions and I think Kate and Blinder as well, I know you wanted to say something about the Sporting Heritage and about the campaign you're running. Yeah, um, thank you, David. That was uh, really informative. I think a really important thing to let you all know is that David has created a fantastic 10 minute tutorial video um, where he creates a really short video in OpenShot. So he looks at the layering of the tracks with the audio and the images over the top and takes you through each step really, really clearly. Um, it's, a kind of, it's a tool that we hope when you come to editing your film, you'll be able to use as a kind of companion uh, if you gather all of your materials beforehand, so your shot footage, your images and your audio, it will take you through. And it's really useful, honestly. I've, I've learned so much from that as well. Um, yeah, so just before we head into our Q&A, um, give David a bit of a minute for a breather. Um, yes, I'll circulate that afterwards, Anita. So it'll come around with the, um, with the slides. Um, so you'll know that this is one of the free webinars in our um, Lottery Heritage Funded um, Digital Stories series. Um, there's five in total. Uh, the next one is actually next Tuesday at 11 a.m. Um, with Russell Todd, which is about editing podcasts. So if podcast is also your thing, come along to that. 
Um, and then we have three more sessions in January on Thursday the 7th, 14th and 21st, which will focus on building a community to share all of your content with, uh, delivering a virtual session and obtaining funding for your digital projects. So keep an eye out for links um, to those as they come up in the coming weeks. Um, also, as uh, David pointed out, some of those free resources we have. Um, if you are interested in becoming a member of Sporting Heritage CIC, uh, you'll be able to gain access to future workshops beyond this series. Um, you'll also receive a free 60 minute consultation with a heritage expert, um, all about whatever you need in your organisation. Um, and you can head to the website to sign up. There's also going to be some really exciting benefits coming up in the coming months. So it's something to keep an eye out for and to consider. Um, but as for your filmmaking journey, um, ask away, start asking your questions in the chat. But um, we have a bit of a challenge for you. Uh, we need your help really to gather some exciting films which really showcase what the sector's about. Uh, so perhaps you ran a special event for National Sporting Heritage Day 2020 and have some footage you could put together using some of these techniques. Or maybe you're doing something quite creative or innovative using your sporting collection. So that could be some reminiscence work or a special exhibition. Uh, we want to be able to use your stories to kind of spread awareness of the benefits of sporting collections um, across the network and beyond. So we'd love it if you could give filmmaking a go um, and editing. Uh, and tell us a story, um, a sporting story, or tell us about an activity you're doing as an individual or organisation. Um, it'd be great if you could kind of use the new year to kick things off and get a film across to us um, in February um, so that you can become part of this bank of kind of inspirational assets that we can use to um, inspire the sector and kind of just share the fantastic work that we do, really. Um, so questions. We gathered some of the questions that you sent over um, ahead of this webinar. Um, thank you to everybody who did send questions. I know David's kind of uh, fed that into his presentation, so hopefully quite a lot of those questions have been answered. Uh, but we've got a little question list here and we'll also go through any that you have if you just pop them in the chat now. Oh, David, have you got that screen of questions? We can oh, keep sorry, let's do that. <coughs> Sorry, David, did I just shut down your presentation? <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry, of course. <laughs> you might have to share it again, sorry. Just uh, get my FAQs back up. Yeah, brilliant. You can see those, can't you? So I, I, we had a couple of questions during the actual presentation from Anita. Um, First one, David, was what's a B-roll? Yeah. Okay, great. So B-roll, if, you, if you're thinking of start production, uh, when you're shooting a piece to camera, yeah, where you're presenting something, um, the actual main sort of content of your video is camera, uh, so you'll call that the okay. telling your story, etc. The B-roll is kind of any sort of supplementary material that you can use to tell that story. So, you know, let's say you've got um, an object, you know, that you might want to film or you might want to photograph. And the B-roll is kind of like the separate video and the separate audio files to the A-roll, if that makes sense. So you'd put your A-roll on your timeline, edit that appropriately, and then you'd use your B-roll, you know, to kind of supplement the messages that you're delivering um, with your voice, essentially. You know, it's additional visual material. Thanks, David. Um, and another one from Anita was about the properties panel on the open shot screen and not being able to either not having that or not being able to see that on her version of open shot. Yeah, that's absolutely fine. So what you might need to do with that is if you um, go to the view section at the top um, you'll have an option to view the simple or the advanced view. If you can't see the properties panel, you might be on the simple view. So just double check that, make sure you're on the advanced view. Um, and then you'll be able to see the properties panel when you click on a piece of media in the timeline, you know, where I click on something that should automatically show up. Well, thanks, David. I thought it might be something really simple like that, but unless you know where to go, it's, it's really difficult. Um, we've had a question from Helen about music. If you want to add generic background music to your video, are there any preloaded on OpenShot to use? And if not, where can you go for them? And I think Shane from the Hockey Museum has just sent a link to the free music archive, but have you got any other ideas for music? 
Yeah, the free music archive is brilliant. Um, another one you might want to consider if you're using YouTube is uh, there's a YouTube audio library that has a huge selection of free royalty for your music to use in your videos if you're putting them on YouTube. Um, another one you might want to have a look at is a website called uh, Mixer, which also has royalty free licenses too, which is great if you're working in the heritage sector or you know doing videos sort of there uh, around that sort of thing. Okay. So that's Mixer. Um, if you just Google that, you'll be able to find that. Brilliant. Thanks, David. Um, does anybody have any other questions? I've got one message here. And if not, if you would like to, to ask a question, then um, if you put your hand up, I'll try and unmute you as well. If you just want to, if you have a question you want to ask directly of David, that's absolutely fine. And if not, I guess David can go through some of his FAQs. Sure. Um, so no questions. Okay. Um, all right. That's it. If you could just repeat the name of the YouTube, the music one for YouTube videos. Um, yeah, that's the YouTube audio library. So to access that, you'll need a YouTube account. Um, and when you go up to, when you have the option to upload videos, you know, on your YouTube channel, um, you should see an option for the audio library. Uh, so you'll be able to browse through that and you can just download the, the music off the audio library as MP3 files, and then just insert them into OpenShot that way or, you know, your editor of choice. Okay, yeah, so there's no more questions at the moment. Um, so yeah, if you want to go through some of the FAQs, David, that would be really useful, I think. Yeah, absolutely. So um, one of the questions that gets asked a lot in this sort of thing is style. And then, um, you know, this, I think, kind of comes back to, um, you know, sort of like the, co the current content trends, you know, I think somebody Somebody asked me recently about, you know, is it appropriate to look at, say, YouTube bloggers and apply that to like a heritage context? Um, my answer to that would be, I think, do whatever feels right for your, for your organization, really, for your brand, you know. So like NFM, for instance, you know, we have a particular way of doing things where, you know, we, we, we tend to go for like an authority angle on a lot of things. Um, but I don't think we're shy of using sort of, um, you know, trendy things in our videos, you know, to make them engage, you know, trendy styles of editing things and presenting things. So, you know, for instance, we might show unboxings of things on cameras, you know, that's a popular video content genre. And, you know, that can be used to kind of make your collection engaging and, and you know, get people to, to watch your stuff, essentially get people to enjoy it. Um, another sort of question that comes up a lot is about how long an edit might take, um, you know, how much time should you put aside to edit a video project? Um, there's a rule of thumb where if you're shooting a minute of video footage, you should really budget five minutes, you know, to edit that particular minute, maybe, you know, something like that. You, you could look at it that way. So, you know, if you're shooting a 10 minute video, you know, maybe it might take an hour, a couple of hours, something like that to edit it. So I think probably you could you can imagine doing a video project in a day's worth of time, you know, if you, if you plan it very, very well and you know exactly what you're doing with it, uh, it's useful to maybe say book a day out to produce something and, you know, you might get faster at doing it as well and it might, might be simpler than that depending on how complicated it is. Um, another good question really is how to measure success. Um, and, you know, this, this can be done in different ways, you know, it depends on Depends on your organization, really. If you're going for the amount of time somebody's viewed a video, uh, you know, you might be disappointed if you're only a small organization with small social media reach, for instance, but you might find it more beneficial to say that 10 people have engaged with that video and you've acted upon it, you know, so if you put out a call out, say, for stories or particular pieces of content and you get 10 emails back from people, Obviously, that's much more successful than saying 100 people viewed the video, isn't it? You know, that gives you something to act with, some kind of content, doesn't it, to, to work with. Um, again, if you're working in an organisation and you're looking for ways to advocate for doing more video projects, bearing in mind, you know, that it does take a bit of time and it might take um, a bit of investment from a skills point of view. Um, I think you can't really underestimate the sort of online trends that are going, you know, the video content at the moment. I think if we look at the internet in a couple more years, I wouldn't be surprised if even more of it is video content than it is now. You know, more people watching video content than they are reading articles and stuff like that. 
And I think if you've got the right story, it can be a really, really powerful way of, you know, showcasing, um, you know, certain things compared to say, just writing some text for something or maybe just sharing an image, you know, I think it's a very, very versatile way of doing things really. So, you know, that's a good place to start from. And, you know, you might find that you've got a very, very young audience who'll be able to engage more with the content, you know, if it's presented in a video format rather than say a big long blog piece. So I guess it depends on your goals really for that. Um, one that might be relevant to some of you guys is being about a one person team, you know, but really keen to do videos. Um, I mean, when I first started doing videos at NFM, you know, I was doing a lot of it on my own at the time and, you know, gradually more people got involved in it, I think. Um, so, you know, I, I, I kind of get that. Um, I think the advice I'd give to you in that situation is really, you know, I can't say enough about planning things well, you know, and really kind of trying to break the time down and really kind of understanding what would be required of you, you know, project to project, video to video, I guess. And that will help you manage your time and, you know, it'll help you kind of make sure you're doing it, you know, using it the most effective way you can do. You know, in each sort of project you do, you'll get better at it. It does look very simple, I think, when you first look at it. Um, but, you know, there's always ways you can improve things and you only really get that, I think, by, by doing it. You know, you practice by doing, don't you? And I think to some extent, it's a bit of a pursued interest, you know, in that the more you do something, you know, the better you'll get at it, won't you? So... It is really about now having a go at it and seeing what works for you and what doesn't and then building from there, I think. Um, and the final thing, probably just to reiterate, just about resources, I'd say, you know, keep looking at sports and heritage and, um, you know, they're producing all sorts of really good stuff. So, you know, keep an eye out for their stuff and, you know, it's really, it should really help you along if this is your first time doing videos. Um, I think that's pretty much it for all our FAQs. Um, We've got a couple more questions that have just come through, David. Um, from sure. Anika, is there a recommended ratio of images to video or does it just depend on your message? I wonder if videos, if viewers prefer, prefer video. Um, it's a good question. It depends on your message. And of course, instead of using images, if you want to, you could just film separate things. You know, you've got access to actually film things and, and have more moving image in the video, then that's absolutely fine. Um, I'd say in terms of audience engagement, every time you cut away from something, you know, if, you, if you're putting another shot, another cut away on, that's almost like a bit of a stimulus to keep people, you know, alert, isn't it? You know, if you're watching one particular thing for a while, you know, you can find yourself sort of almost going on autopilot, can't you? So by putting more shots in, it kind of keeps your, your audience stimulated there, doesn't it? Um, but obviously, you know, it does depend on, on exactly what the message is. So if you're going through... Like with our first 11 series at the National Football Museum, for instance, you know, like we use a lot of images in that um, and we'll be changing them approximately every sort of five seconds, really, you know, as the script moves on. So, you know, it really does depend on how you script things, really, and what the message is there. Thanks, David. And a question from Katie. Where is the best place to host your video content? Um, I've got one on Vimeo, but partly because I wasn't confident I'm going onto YouTube. Sure, yeah. I mean, with that, I suppose it's really a question of audience. Um, I'd say compared to YouTube, Vimeo is a smaller platform, um, you know, in terms of the total number of users on it. You know, YouTube is, is billions of users versus Vimeo is millions, essentially. So um, I guess it depends on what you want to do from an audience point of view. You know, if you're using the, the, bigger, the bigger platforms are places like um, Facebook and YouTube. Um, but they have their own sort of considerations, like with Facebook, for instance, you know, if you're posting from a page, um, what you might find on there is you've got a limited audience, unless you're paying to promote it, basically, uh, you know, because uh, the Facebook algorithm suppresses posts which aren't paid for, essentially. So you might find it more beneficial to post on YouTube, you know, if you're going for that sort of mass market audience. Of course, you know, if your audience is more active on Twitter, then, you know, your videos really should be there. You know what I mean? You should, you should go to the place where you can have the most impact with your audience, I think. And David, you can, you can put things on Twitter and then link to YouTube, can't you? So if you've got longer content, you just, you can, you can do it that way. Because obviously you can't put those longer videos on Twitter, can you? But you can link from Twitter to YouTube as a way of getting that, that all of that content out. Absolutely, yeah. So as I mentioned before, you know, the, the maximum length on Twitter is uh, um, two minutes and 20 seconds, 100, 140 seconds in total. So 
what you might find useful for that sort of platform. If you have a longer piece of content to show, you could actually take a bit of that longer video, cut some of it out and have that as a teaser video for Twitter and then use that to promote your YouTube link. You know, it makes the post more visible, doesn't it? And just posting a link. Thank you. Just a couple more. Um, is there any research to say whether viewers prefer a voiceover or just music? It's a good question. I think what I probably point you to on that is the fact that a lot of videos aren't actually watched with sound on you know places like Facebook in particular. Um, I think it's probably more important to have it accessible in in that sense. You know, use your subtitles and your titles and all that sort of thing. Um, rather than worrying about voiceover and music. I think from a personal point of view, I probably find it more interesting to listen to something that's narrated versus something that is just titles, you know, if I'm listening to something with sound, you know what I mean? Um, but I guess from a research point of view, I'd, I'd have to look that up for you. Okay, thank you. And one final question from Pavel, I hope I've pronounced that correctly. Um, what's the best software to create subtitles? Closed captions and is it free? I think you mentioned that earlier. Yes, I did. Actually, it's, it's something really useful. Um, if you've got a YouTube channel, what you can actually do with, with that is um, even if you're not posting your videos there, you could actually go to YouTube and upload a video, say like a private video or as an unlisted video, you know, where people can't see it. Uh, and within YouTube is um, a really good um, closed caption editor. Um, where you'd be able to transcribe the video, you know, as it's playing sort of in real time, or you can upload like a text document. So if you wanted to sit there, send a Word document and write the, you know, the, the transcripts out, you can upload it to the uh, closed captions editor on YouTube. Uh, and that will allow, that, that sort of allows it to assign timings by itself. It does it with like AI, essentially. You know, so it'll listen to your video and then assign the captions to it. Or you can do it manually. And then from there, you can actually download that transcript and they place it on other platforms, you know, like say Facebook, for instance. So that's, that's one I'd have a look at as well. And I think, um, you know, there's a number of other .srt editors online if you just Google those. Um, but my personal choice would be the YouTube one, if you want to do it that way. Just because it's really easy to use and really fully featured. Um, and we've just, um, oh, another one. Yeah, does, does closed captions cope well with, with accents? Does it with accents? You mean yeah, like so yeah, accents? regional accents, I guess. Um, yeah, I mean, there's uh, with that, I think, um, there's actually a really good guide that the BBC released actually, you know, for sort of capturing accents and all that sort of thing, uh, very effectively. If you Google um, BBC closed captioning guidelines, that's the ones I generally tend to stick to as well myself personally. Um, if you Google that, that has all sorts of advice on sort of either replicating regional accents effectively or, you know, you know where relevant, you know what I mean, or, um, or you know, substituting where, where necessary to. Okay, thank you. And there's one question from Cedric. I'm not sure if I'm um, interpreting the question correctly. I think it's about monetizing video editing. Mm -hmm. um, is there a platform where you can create money by video editing? So I'm not sure if that means monetizing the videos that people are watching at all. I know it's very difficult to do that, isn't it? To try and create content that people will pay to watch. Mm -hmm. um, if it is that, I mean, I think it's, you know, the classic one is um, YouTube, uh, you know, for running adverts and stuff like that and promotions on videos. Um, but I mean, I'll be, that's, that's generally more of a marketing thing, I think, really, to be honest, because it depends on sort of building the audience and then going from there really. Um, if you're talking about monetizing the skill of video editing, mm. um, I think, you know, there's numerous sort of online platforms, you know, where you could put yourself out as a freelancer to, to do that. So uh, Fiverr sort of springs to mind, you know, where you can do sort of low cost uh, projects and stuff like that on there. Uh, you know, if you have the skills and the equipment to do it. Um, otherwise, you know, I suppose it's down to yourself, isn't it? To, to build your own networks and, you know, sell your skills that way. Yeah, I have noticed that a lot of jobs that are um, available in the heritage sector at the moment have the words digital in them and um, your digital producer or digital content person is, is really, really key, I think, at the moment in lots of heritage organisations. So if you can do it, I think that's a, it's a fantastic skill to have, definitely. 
Yeah, I think on, on that note, if that's something you're interested in, I think um, the sort of route I'd go down with that is um, really trying to earn the Adobe suite. So Adobe Premiere Pro, Adobe After Effects, Adobe Audition and all that sort of thing. And these are very kind of advanced programs and, you know, there's, there's training available for those online if you want to put yourself through it. But if you're aiming for that sort of thing, I'd, I'd say go for that high standard because that makes your skills more marketable. Uh, these programs are the industry standard, you know, and if you're, if you're doing like a sort of high level freelance gig, they'll, they'll expect you really to be able to do something, you know, using those tools, you know, it's the standard you can do. So that'd be my advice, I think, if that's what you're asking. Brilliant, thanks, David. Okay, I think that's all of the questions that we have. Um, thank you to everyone. We are gonna to aim to have um, this webinar up on the Sputton Heritage YouTube channel, um, hopefully in the next 48 hours or so. And we'll send out David's 10 minute tutorial, this presentation, and there'll be um, some evaluation to do as well. So everybody who's attended will get that hopefully in the next couple of days. And we'd absolutely love it if you could fill in the evaluation form, get in touch with me and Kate, if you've got any more questions about Sporting Heritage and our project. Um, and like Kate said, if you want to contribute to, our, to Sporting Heritage's digital assets, please just let us know. We'd love to see your stories and we can share them as widely as we can. So you'll benefit from Sporting Heritage's own network there if you, if you, if you share them with us as well. Um, but thank you very much and a massive thanks to David as well. It's a fantastic presentation, really, really useful. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Bye. Thank you, Bye.